For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. And we kick off this week's fun-filled readout video from our Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter with a chart. Yay! It's also a plug for merchandise, which we hope to be offering soon, and if it sells really well, there will be fewer fundraising pitches during our videos. So be sure to order yours in time for Christmas. Specifically, this chart. You've probably seen the scary climate stripes graphic that Greta Thunberg just pounced on and posed against, showing how it's now scary dark red hot when it used to be cool comfy blue. Sort of like Red America, which we'll get to. Alarmists love this one so much that it's available on all kinds of merch, from shirts to mugs to, oh yes, a COVID mask for the double virtue signaler on your list. But that graphic is a big problem because in the first place, it's cherry-picked from near the bottom of a known natural cooling called the Little Ice Age, and therefore depicts a natural rebound as terrifying and unprecedented, and also because if you look closely at it, you'll see the temperature has fluctuated even since 1850 in ways that CO2 can't begin to explain. Now, back to ours. It covers the last half million years, not just the last century and a half, and it's an even bigger problem for alarmists because what it shows is that our once warm and lush planet has spent most of that time worryingly cold and inhospitable to life. And that the faint glow of blessed warmth we've experienced very recently is nothing like as warm as during previous interglacials that did not see those fabled tipping points or runway greenhouse effect. It's certainly not unprecedented. And also, this graphic suggests that the little narrow orange band we're in will soon, like previous ones, give way to truly scary dark blue. But until that actual climate disaster happens, we're working on merch of our own, including other versions of our graphic covering other time periods. How much fun can a person have? Lots, including in the kitchen. We noted in September that because green crabs aren't popular, their spread is being blamed on climate change, though they don't really like warm water very much. But then someone asked, well, why don't people just cook them and eat them, since crab is generally considered a delicacy. And we went online and we discovered that yes, there are green crab recipes. And some are quite enthusiastic, like green crab and monkfish ceviche, whereas others are sort of more dutiful, this is one way to chew through those critters. But in the process, we also discovered that up Alaska way, the snow crab, being a long-established delicacy, is supposedly being killed by climate change. Boo, climate change. Fortunately, it turns out that it's actually just one of those very familiar boom and bust cycles where an abundance of food triggers a population explosion, and the population explosion eats the food, and then the population explosion crashes again. You remember the one with rabbits and foxes or wolves from high school biology? Yeah, it's nature red and tooth claw and pincer yet again. Apparently, in this case, it got so bad that snow crabs were eating one another. And we also discovered that the nearby Bristol Bay red king crab population is also in trouble, but it has been for years. So, climate change is helping one crab because we don't like it very much, it's hurting another because we do, and it's doing some weird dang thing to a third one. This is known in the trade as settled science. Of course, life isn't all beer and monkfish ceviche, and thus Britain's Daily Mail took a break from reporting about UK households struggling to afford heat to warn that, quote, 29 million US households already cannot pay bills and families are buying fewer groceries to keep the lights on. Study says cold weather and rising costs will deepen the crisis, end quote. And it turns out there's something of a red-blue America divide here, with the mail saying, quote, The research exposes fault lines across the U.S., with southern Republican-leaning states like Texas, Mississippi, and West Virginia home to larger numbers of struggling families, while Washington, D.C., Vermont, and Delaware are the least affected, end quote. Which might be because the Democrats are increasingly the party of prosperous coastal elites, and Republicans that of the struggling hinterland. Oh, and by the way, the denialistic outfit that provided those scary numbers was the U.S. Census Bureau, which the mail says also found, quote, that many more American families, 43 million households, have cut back spending on groceries, medicine, and doctor's visits so they could settle an energy bill, end quote. And this is happening in what is, or was, the most advanced economy in the world. So, how is that energy transition working for you? Well, various news outlets insist that gas remains the cheapest way to heat American homes, even though alternative fuels are now supposedly way cheaper than gas. So, somebody failed economics. And journalism. Or perhaps not, given modern standards. Because, in another item, we invite readers to imagine two competing headlines. One says, quote, August-like heat places 100 million people under heat alerts, end quote. 
And the other says, quote, November like chill places 100 million people under frost and freeze alerts, end quote. So, which story mentions climate? Yep, you guessed it again. The real headline was the latter one. It was on NBC on October 19th, and the story said not a word about climate. But then, two weeks later, NBC reported that, quote, it's unseasonably warm in Europe this fall, climate researchers are feeling the heat, end quote, and there it is, right in the headline, and with 12 other instances in the story. That's how you do it. And thus, of course, quote, cold blasts to bring record-breaking temperatures to large part of U.S. this week, end quote, is merely weather, whereas, quote, summer heat waves killed record number of pensioners, end quote, is definitely climate. Here, I'm going to interrupt myself briefly to thank all of you who are watching, and especially those who've subscribed, who are sharing the material, and who are contributing financially. And for the rest of you, I want to urge you, please, do click the subscribe button because it helps other people find us. Share it directly with friends, family, co-workers, anyone you think might find it helpful, and do click here and make a pledge. $2, $3, $5, cup of coffee a month. It's what we need to keep bringing sanity to the climate debate. And now, back to the show. In the newsletter, we also note that with her administration's reckless fiscal and monetary policy unraveling so blatantly that even she can see it, Canada's would-be sane finance minister, Christia Freeland, delivered what was sold to us as a responsible fiscal update. Unfortunately, it cranked up spending, increased handouts, and sketched out an industrial strategy of all museum pieces to transform the economy into a place where wishes are horses, complete with getting rid of energy that works, so maybe I should say where wishes are unicorns. And the story is interesting to us partly because back when we were in college, many of our professors claimed that large corporations were becoming the dominant actors in politics, both domestic and international, wielding something called power before which governments cringed. And yes, it was essentially the Communist Manifesto claim that, quote, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie, end quote. But once we got out of the cloistered academic realm, we saw that when a government threatens a company, the company usually grovels before those with real hard power, though also, unfortunately, often with soft minds. And so it is that, according to Chris Varco in the Calgary Herald, quote, Christia Freeland announced plans to introduce a tax on stock repurchases by public companies, part of the government's effort to encourage them to reinvest their profits in workers and in Canada, end quote. But what it really means is that fossil fuel companies in particular can either put their money into projects that they know are losers thanks to government hostility, or hand the money straight to those hostile governments, or find some way to smuggle the money out the back door pronto. So, at some point, we're going to be reading stories about how millions of Canadians are skimping on groceries to try to heat their homes in the winter, and wonder how it came about. And apparently at that point, Greta Thunberg will jump up to shrill at us that it's all the fault of capitalism, even as the executive committee of the bourgeoisie exterminates that class. And we recently praised Thunberg, but she's now turned into Karl Marx and Pigtails and Wokeface with her The Climate Book about how the climate breakdown thingy, quote, has its roots in racist, oppressive extractivism that is exploiting both people and the planet to maximize short-term profits for a few, end quote. And her deep thoughts now include, quote, we need to change everything because right now our current system is on a collision course with the future of humanity and the future of our civilization, end quote. Right. We'll just change everything, shall we? Like that. Including the laws of physics and of economics, the principles of logic, and embarrassment at purple prose. Yo, oh, and the lesson of history that fanatical revolutions make the world even worse than it already was. Still, there is value on her having gone full watermelon on us. And not because it confirms that online meme, quote, it's not really about climate, is it, end quote. On the contrary, it's valuable because it shows that people like Dunbury have this weird cosmic awareness in which all good things come bundled together, and so do all bad things. They don't think in terms of trade-offs and cost-benefit analysis. They think all the pluses are there to be grabbed together without any of the minuses, as all the minuses are there to be grabbed without any of the pluses. So to them, fighting against climate change is fighting for justice, and vice versa. Fighting against war is fighting for the environment, and vice versa, and so forth. And it's so easy if you just care. Thus, a few weeks earlier, Climate Home News cheerfully noted that, quote, as the UK's COP26 president Alok Sharma put it on Friday, the world is recognizing that we cannot tackle the defining challenge of this century with institutions defined by the last, end quote. 
And while it's tempting to brush it aside as soporific and sophomoric bloviating, the guy who ran the last cop really did just blithely brush aside all the institutions by which we run our affairs, from governments to corporations to the UN, which there at least we agree, and who knows, you know, maybe the family as well. And the activist crowd nodded and went, yeah, obliterate civilization, obliterate society, start over at ground zero with net zero. That yeah, sounds like a plan. Sounds like the plan, in fact, the usual one. So you can't just dismiss Dunbury as some bratty Swedish death goblin with good PR. Her book attracted contributions from responsible adults like Canadian social justice warrior and author Nomi Klein, COVID lockdown enthusiast Tedros Anhanam Ghebreyesus, who's head of the World Health Organization, and trendy economist Thomas Piketty, because these people really do think this way. It's not a plot, it's a plan. And so we thank Greta Thunberg for laying bare just exactly how much climate alarmism is communism and vice versa. And we say, don't say you weren't warned. In the newsletter, we also continue our Everybody Knows series because from no less an authority than experts, we learn via Twitter that, quote, experts say climate change is making drought and flooding worse across the globe, end quote. These experts apparently have a lot to say. Quote, climate change is intensifying water-related disasters across the world, according to experts, end quote. So, with COP27 starting in Egypt, more experts are telling us more stuff that everybody knows without bothering to check what other experts said. For instance, the experts the IPCC got to write their most recent report. But we did look. Chapter 11 of the IPCC 6th Assessment Report, published in August 2021, had this to say about global trends in extreme precipitation. Quote, there are studies in regions of almost all continents that generally indicate intensification of subdaily extreme precipitation, although there remains low confidence in an overall increase at the global scale. Section 11.4.2, end quote. And then it said this about flooding. Quote, confidence about peak flow trends over past decades on the global scale is low. But there are regions experiencing increases, including parts of Asia, southern South America, the northeast USA, northwestern Europe, and the Amazon, and regions experiencing decreases, including parts of the Mediterranean, Australia, Africa, and the southwestern USA, section 11.5.2, end quote. We excerpt more of it on the blog, but the bottom line is that some things are going up in some places, down in others, and others are doing something different, exactly as if it were natural variability. But that's just the IPCC. Why ask them what everybody knows, including these famous experts on Twitter, that climate change is making flooding and drought worse around the world? And speaking of the IPCC, with COP27 convening in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, to bemoan the sky being on fire, and pointing out the window at all the hot sand nearby, we went to the handy IPCC online atlas to see how climate change has affected Egypt specifically. And yes, it's gotten a bit warmer. But as for precipitation, flooding, aridity, wind, sandstorms, and coastal flooding, it's a big wallache, as in nothing. Here's the map view over Egypt of mean precipitation. Yellow means a downward trend, pink means upward, and no color means no identified trend. Here it is for heavy precipitation and flooding. Again, nothing. Nor is there for aridity. As for mean wind speed, it shows Egypt just south of the region where they observed a slight decline. For sand and dust storms, nada in any language you care to choose. Finally, coastal flooding trends are zero. Still, stand by for an increase in strong wind from Sharm el-Sheikh because the people there are determined to save the world, which means they need something to save it from. No, or not, because we again dip into the CO2science.org archive for a look at the medieval warm period, which alarmists claim didn't happen and was confined to Europe. And we discover that it is strongly visible, though a bit later, in Tibet, where it was definitely warmer than today. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I'm looking forward to having stripes across my shoulders. <laughs>